What? Okay, so we're ready. So first things first, I just learned today is Cindy Robertson's birthday, so we let's give her a round of applause to embarrass her. No singing. <laughs> so um, today's colloquium is uh, the title is Quantum Control versus Chaos, and the um, Speaker today is our own Paul Yassin, a very impressive CV, a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's been here for 20 years, um, 25 years, a professor, and you can read all about on his CV. But what you don't know, the latest thing from his CV is not on his CV yet. So very recently, um, you've been reading about North Korea. North Korea developed some secret weapon and had pinned down um, Navy SEAL Team 6, and they flew in Yassin, to solve the problem. And they made a training video. Well, it's probably just easier to show you a clip from the training video um, as a result of that incident. Your weapons are useless. We have no idea what they are. I know what they are. It means this stuff isn't natural. But there are unnatural states, artificial states, man made states. Condensate. Bose Einstein condensate. A state of matter that was predicted by Nat Bose and Albert Einstein. It has some very unusual properties. It's so cold it will kill you instantly on contact. So, so what we learn from this is quantum mechanics is dangerous. It can kill you. And so, um, Paul Yesen, our speaker, has mastered quantum mechanics. And so, for your own safety, pay close attention as he gives his colloquium. Um, today and tells us all about quantum mechanics and use of quantum mechanics. Here you go. I think you got your videos messed up. That was that was Brian Anderson. <laughs> it's always a little unnerving to uh, be introduced by Charlie. You never know what he will come up with. You never know whether this will work, but it did. All right. <clears throat> so uh, I was uh, asked to step in and fill an empty slot on relatively short notice, and I said, hmm, uh, I have a canned talk that I've already given here uh, at the end of the 2017 Optics and Photonics Winter School and Workshop. So. I don't think that very many, if any of you, were actually there. But if you have seen this before, if it's something that you think you recognize, that would be why. Uh, because I don't think I have given a colloquium either here at OPSI or in our physics department for somewhere in the five to seven year uh, range. So uh, uh, a lot has happened since last time. Uh, one of the things is that I've become a self-admitted control freak. Uh, I think my students have always known that, but it will be clear to the rest of you what I mean by that. So uh, today I would like to hit upon three main themes. One is that uh, if we're talking about controlling physical systems, be they classical or quantum, this is really something that merits thinking about as a scientific discipline in its, in its own right. So I'll try to uh, make clear why you should think of it that way. Uh, then I will move on to talk about an application of quantum control, namely quantum simulation. And what that is about is using one physical system to model another. And we'll talk a little bit about why we should think about doing that. And then finally, uh, I will bring in the idea of quantum chaos and uh, in particular discuss that one might simulate quantum chaos, and that has something to do with the fact that that pushes uh, our ability to control a physical system to its very limits, and as a result of that, it can kind of test whether this is actually a reasonable idea. Okay, so control is a science and engineering discipline in its own right. Uh, we can define it as the science and engineering of making physical systems. We call them devices do what we want them to do rather than what they do naturally on their own. You're probably used to thinking about quantum mechanics as something rather abstract that tells us, for example, why a hydrogen atom has the structure it has. But 
Uh, these days, actually, the cutting edge of quantum physics is much more about saying, OK, we know quantum mechanics works. It describes the natural world. Can we turn it around and instead leverage quantum effects to do things that wouldn't be possible in a world that was entirely governed by classical mechanics? OK, so the idea that control is a, is a science uh, is actually not new. It goes back all the way to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is uh, the so-called James Watt uh, steam engine governor. When steam engines were first invented, they had a, a bad tendency to either start running too fast, and uh, as they ran faster, uh, there would be like a positive feedback loop, and they would just spin ever, ever faster and tear themselves apart. Or if they started going slower, they would just stall, right? So James Watt came up with this idea, this engine governor, which as you can see here, is basically a set of uh, uh, weights uh, mounted on the shaft. And uh, as the shaft spins faster, uh, the centrifugal force pushes them out further, and that will uh, close a steam valve and slow down the, uh, the engine. So a very simple a mechanical feedback, negative feedback loop. Now, none other than James Clerk Maxwell analyzed this mathematically because in these kinds of setups, uh, there could be a phenomenon called hunting that would occur, basically a self-oscillation due to time lag in, in this feedback loop here. And that really was the birth of model, modern control science. Modern control, control science is about designing stuff like this so that it works uh, uh, efficiently and reliably. And of course, we see that in very, very, very many contexts these days, right? Modern airplane is enormously, hugely complicated, uh, but it can fly itself uh, on a pre-programmed course practically, practically forever until it runs out of fuel. Uh, this is, I think, a, a photo of a chemical plant. Right, where you have uh, products shuttled around in some complicated uh, system. Everything has to happen in the right way at the right time. And it's not a guy who sits and turns knobs to make sure that the chemicals flow in at the right rate, the right quantities. It's all these days controlled. Uh, it's under automated control. And as a matter of fact, in control science, the physical system being controlled is usually referred to as the plant. And that has to do with the fact that control theory originally was about making stuff like this work. Uh, this is uh, the uh, University of Arizona's uh, uh, adaptive optics on one of the big telescopes. If you really want to see uh, control science work at its uh, outermost limit, right? What, what, what's done here is that uh, lasers are going are used to probe the distortion in the atmosphere, uh, and then uh, the information that's gained is fed back to some deformal mirror to take, to take out the, the blurring that will would otherwise occur. And uh, there are all sorts of layers here that involve things like predictive control, that is, looking at the past history to figure out what's likely to happen in the future and so on uh, to make something like this work well. So it, it's, uh, again, it's something that you see in so many different contexts. So here is the standard paradigm for control. Uh, this could be your car's cruise control, or maybe these days, or soon, your car's autopilot. Right? So the idea is we have a system. Uh, we want it to uh, be in a particular state. You can call it the input state. And of course, it isn't necessarily in that state. So we can think of the system as being acted upon by a controller. The controller tells the system where to go, and it goes somewhere. That's the output state. Uh, but it's not exactly going to be where we, where we asked it to go. So we have some sort of sensor that measures the output state and feeds that information back to the controller, which can then take corrective action in a kind of negative feedback loop. So let's be a little more concrete. Okay, Here is a physical system. Uh, inside the system, there is a controller, a driver. Right? There is a starting point and an end point, And there is some trajectory between the two. Presumably, there is a particular trajectory that's optimal in the sense that it involves minimum risk and effort to get from start to finish. And then there's a sensor here that sees what the system is doing and feeds back information to the controller. This is actually a little movie where you can see how that plays out. Right? The system 
is moving along presumably the optimal trajectory, and you can see the sensor here is giving feedback to the driver. And then something unforeseen happens. This wasn't me driving. This is uh, some canyon up near Moab. I've, I'm, I confess I've never been there, but it's very popular with the uh, off-road crowd as uh, an extreme challenge. It's obviously a lot steeper than it looks like uh, in this, in this uh, video here. Anyway, that's why people have roll cages on their Jeeps, I guess. Uh, so I'm showing this little video here just to drive home uh, another idea, right? which is that real systems are often very complex and they can be really sensitive even to making very small errors. And, and even a very small error can lead to some very large deviations from the desired trajectory. I would say that what you had here was catastrophic failure of the control loop. So we, when, when we uh, design controls for some physical systems, say a quantum simulator, uh, we should try to make it robust. That is, it has to work in the presence of imperfections. If it doesn't, it's pretty much useless. Okay, so let us return then to our standard paradigm. Right. And we've added to this idea that it needs to be robust. And of course, under most circumstances, the idea that you have a negative feedback loop indeed makes it robust. If you think of your car's cruise control, right, it is a feedback loop. So if you go uphill, it will automatically correct and feed more uh, gas to the engine, etc. But now let us think about how we can generalize this to quantum devices. So in quantum mechanics, there is an element that you don't see in classical physics. Namely, that if you look at something, you disturb it. Right? We have uncertainty relations. So if you measure the uh, momentum of a particle, you disturb its position. If you measure the position, you disturb its momentum. Now, obviously, uh, if your car was quantum and you measured the momentum and found yourself off the road, that would be no good. Uh, but uh, really what it's about is that we should think about this as not just information flowing from the system to the sensor, right, but also this quantum back action of the sensor onto the system. What that means, actually, is that the idea of doing feedback is not nearly as helpful as it is if you're doing control of a, a classical system. So the alternative to that is doing open loop control. Uh, and it turns out that uh, this is something that is, is just as well studied, really, as a closed loop control. Uh, that too has a, a fairly long history. It actually, one of the first applications of really careful open loop control science that I know of was back in World War II, where people were trying to calculate how a uh, uh, propeller uh, fighter plane, what kind of trajectory it should take off the airfield to, get, to gain as much elevation as possible and become operational as quickly as possible after uh, having spotted enemy aircraft. And it turns out that uh, the flight profile is. Uh, a very non-obvious one. For some planes, it would even involve going up and then diving for a while to build up velocity and then go up again. So uh, the optimal trajectories can be uh, a very non-intuitive. It also turns out that there is even the possibility of having robust or self-correcting control uh, even without feedback. You can build that into open-loop control as well uh, using this generic toolbox that's called optimal control. So this is something that uh, I've gotten interested in and my group has worked on for uh, a number of years now. Uh, this idea of doing open loop optimal control on a quantum system. And uh, the idea is that the toolbox that we call optimal control is really pretty generic. It, it, it's not something that's limited or specific to a particular kind of physical system or a particular kind of control problem or anything like that. It's really uh, a kind of mathematical procedure that you can apply that allows you to make this work. Uh, so we think of what we can do in our laboratory uh, more as putting together a test bed on which we can uh, implement and test uh, various uh, uh, approaches to control and also to diagnostics of control, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we are using is individual laser-cooled cesium atoms. 
Now, atoms, one way we can think of atoms is that they're tiny spinning magnets. We call them spins. And these spins are generally easy to control, either with light uh, or with magnetic fields. And also, uh, if we avoid electronic excitation, if we keep, keep the atoms in the electronic ground state, then these spins are very quantum mechanical. Right? So what that means is that we can, for example, prepare a coherent superposition of uh, a spin that rotates in one direction, we could call it spin up, and a spin that rotates in the other direction, we could call that spin down. And if we make a, a quantum superposition state of that, such spins, such superpositions can last a, a long, long, long time. Uh, people can do this, uh, well, uh, as you will see in our experiment, uh, we're actually doing this with free falling atoms, so if you wait too long, they hit the bottom of the vacuum can. But in ion traps, people can make these kind of superpositions and have them uh, survive for, for seconds or even minutes. Now let's talk a little bit about what the cesium atom actually looks like. Uh, so let's assume that the electro electron in, is in its orbital ground state. So all that we have to deal with are the spin degrees of freedom for the electron and the nucleus. Right, so you've got two spins, and a, uh, the spin of the valence electron, all the others don't matter. So there's a, a valence electron spin, and then there's a nuclear spin, and you can add them together in two ways, either like this, or like they can be pointing in opposite directions, right? When they point in the same direction, you get a larger spin. When they point in opposite directions, you get a smaller spin. The electron is spin one half, so the total spin quantum number is either the spin quantum number of the nucleus plus one half or minus one half, right? So that adds up, uh, up to two possible uh, states of the total spin magnitude, either 4h bar or 3h bar. And then, of course, what you have are uh, states with well-defined projection onto the, the uh, quantization axis, right? So you've got states with quantum numbers f and m sub f. And there are nine up here, and there are seven down here. Uh, that's just the rules of uh, uh, the physics of, of, of quantum mechanical angular momenta for a total of 16 states. So it's well beyond the two-level atom that we typically study in quantum optics. Now, a general quantum state, or wave function, if you will, doesn't have to be one of these magnetic sublevels. It can be any uh, arbitrarily chosen coherent superposition of these states. That is, these probability amplitudes, uh, these complex numbers here, uh, can basically be uh, anything uh, uh, consistent with having a normalized wave function. Now, this atom can be controlled by subjecting it to magnetic fields. It turns out we need radio and microwave frequency fields. Uh, such fields will drive the system, right? And that is described by some Hamiltonian, which is generally going to be time dependent, which will take an initial state, that's some coherent superposition of these guys, and map it to a target state, which is going to be some other coherent superposition of these guys. Right. This is something that we sometimes call a state map, a quantum state to state map. So it's just one of many possible kinds of control tasks you could imagine undertaking with a, a quantum system like this. So what fields are we putting on? Well, what it actually takes to, to do this kind of control, uh, first we have to break the degeneracy between these uh, magnetic sublevels. We do that by putting on a magnetic field. It also serves to define the quantization axis. And we put uh, a field, uh, the field we put on is approximately 3 Gauss. Uh, so about 10 times the Earth's background field. Uh, we have to know it very exactly. In units of the Lama precession frequency for this spin, this field is uh, a megahertz to within at least a part in 10 to the 5. Uh, then we can apply radio frequency fields at a megahertz that will couple all the states up here and all the states down here. And actually, with two radio frequency fields along the x and the y axis, we can independently rotate this manifold and this manifold, or if you will, this spin and this spin. And then finally, to be able to go from any state to any state, we also have to have some coupling between these two groups of states. So we have to have a microwave field to couple these two. This is uh, microwaves at approximately 10 gigahertz. Uh, okay. Now, 
not only can the atom be controlled, uh, there is uh, a concept that people use called controllability in, in control science. And what that means is that we can do the most general thing that physics allows. And what is the most general thing that's allowed here? Well, it turns out that the most general thing you can do is not take one state to one state or two states to two states, but take a whole basis of states, right? So a, whole, a complete set of orthogonal vectors that span the state space for this quantum system. So uh, with six levels, right, there's going to be 16 of them. As a matter of fact, these guys here, these states here, are one possible such basis. But uh, if, in principle, uh, your time-dependent Hamiltonian can be made to map any initial orthogonal basis onto another orthogonal basis, that is, you can do a full unitary transformation on this system, then you have the ability to undertake the most general quantum control task possible. Right? And then we say that the system is controllable. So uh, our total magnetic, time-dependent magnetic field is apart from the bias field, apart from parts from the two radio frequency fields, and then there's this microwave field as well. Right? And these guys here oscillate at a megahertz. This os oscillates to 10 gigahertz. And they all have particular phases, these oscillations. And those phases are something we can change in time. Right? So we can phase modulate these things, phase modulate these fields. And so the time-dependent phases of the radio frequency and microwave fields is what we play with. These are the knobs we turn in our physical system in order to execute a particular map uh, of a state to a state or states to states. So we refer to these time-dependent phase modulation waveforms as control waveforms. And what do they look like? Uh, it turns out for uh, the purpose of, of finding appropriate control waveforms, it's actually it's something, you, it's a problem you have to hand over to a computer for optimization, and it's it's easiest if you let these phases be piecewise constant. So what you have here is, for example, that the phase of the RF magnetic field pointing along x, its phase changes in time piecewise like this. Similarly for the other RF field and for the microwave field. And so let's just imagine that we want to start in this particular state here. And we want to end up in a coherent superposition of these two. Right? So we want to go from this state, f equals 4, m equals 4, to this coherent superposition here. So this is our target state. It's here shown as what's called a density matrix. So along the diagonal here, these columns tell us the population or probability of finding the atom in each of these states over here. And then these off-diagonal elements tells us about the amount of quantum coherence that we have between those states. And that's the idea. Okay. And initially, we're in this state here. We want to go here. This is actually a movie that will show you as we go through this uh, phase modulation sequence what happens to this state. Hopefully, it'll end up looking like that. So let's see. Nope. And as you can see, it, it looks rather messy. Uh, this is not something that you can, can intuit that this is the right path to go from there to there. Right? As a matter of fact, it's not until the very end. I can learn it again. It's not until the very end that you can see uh, the desired target state pop up. Right, so it, it's, it's not a question of being clever and sitting down and thinking hard about how to, uh, in this case, modulate the phases of your uh, RF and microwave magnetic fields. Uh, and so that's where we get to this idea of optimal control. And I could spend time talking about this, but then I wouldn't be getting to any of the other topics. Uh, just as a bit of a, a sort of a concept. To, to, to communicate a bit of the concept behind the idea. Right? You've got these faces. These are knobs that you can turn in order to get the Hamiltonian to do different things. So imagine that you just had two control faces, right? instead of the whole bunch I just showed you. Right? Then we could make a plot where there was one face on this axis, one face on that axis, and the probability of success, what we call the fidelity on this axis. And presumably, there would be some control landscape with some maxima. Uh, 
right? And so what you do in optimal control, basically, is that you make a random guess, and then you hand it over to the computer to do a gradient ascent, al ascent algorithm that just walks uphill until you end up on one of these peaks. And if all these peaks go to a probabil success probability of 1, then you're good. Then it's a benign control problem. And it turns out that generally when you want to do state-to-state -state maps or unitary transformations, the problem is benign. But of course, if you have 256 phases rather than two, right, this becomes a 256-dimensional hypersurface. Uh, and uh, the uh, numerical problem becomes, can become rather brutal. But it's certainly doable on a, on a modern computer. Here's what it looks like in the laboratory. Uh, so in the center here, we have a little glass cell where we laser cool a million cesium atoms. And then we release, release them. And they're so cold that they just, just like dropping a handful of gravel. Uh, so it takes them 10, 20 milliseconds to move appreciably. And in that, they're just in free fall, which is an ideal environment to work with them because they're not perturbed by a trap or anything like that. Uh, you can see some, maybe you can see some wires here that are magnetic field calls for DC and RF fields. And then there are some horns here, microwave horns here for shining on the microwaves. So it's, it's a relatively uh, simple uh, little experiment. Really, most of the effort here goes into learning how to control the applied magnetic fields and eliminate background fields as far as possible. And uh, we can indeed go and implement the waveform I just showed you in the laboratory, and we can go from our target state to the desired, uh, from our initial state to the desired target state, target state, and we can reconstruct what we made in, lab, in the lab using uh, something called quantum tomography. So here's an experimental reconstruction, if you will, or imaging of the, of the quantum state. And here's a, a, a target state that was chosen as some random superposition, and again, we, we uh, get uh, a density matrix that looks right. Now, uh, it turns out that this is not really the best way of deciding how, or measuring how, how well we do. Uh, there are more accurate methods uh, that I won't go into here. Uh, but basically, if the task is to go from a known initial state to a desired uh, final state, we can do that with a fidelity that is a success probability of about 99.5%. That is. Uh, only five out of a thousand times do we not land in the right state. So that's pretty good. Uh, I think it's probably close to uh, a state of the art for a quantum system uh, with this many levels. Uh, the unitary transformations I talked about where you map 16 states to 16 states, that's a harder task, uh, but still our success probability is over 98%. And uh, for those of you who are interested, there are papers on our group website. So with that, I, I would uh, like to think that I've given you an idea of what quantum control is about. Uh, and from now on, I'll just say this is a resource that's available in our laboratory and in many, many other places uh, to do further work. And now let's talk about something that we can do with it. Oh, so that's a good idea. Good, good question. Uh, there are two ways of looking at it. Uh, one way is just to ask me, well, how many microseconds? Uh, in this particular experiment, it took 210 microseconds, right? But it could be shorter if I turned up the strength of the magnetic fields. So that's sort of highly context specific. On the other hand, you can also say, how many real valued variables go into specifying a d dimensional quantum state? Well, it's, uh, uh, the, com the, the, the probability amplitudes are complex numbers, and there are d of them, right? So it's 2d, but there are two constraints, normalization, and the overall phase doesn't matter, so it's 2d minus 2, right? And you have to have at least that many free variables in your control waveforms uh, to make it work, right? Otherwise, there's not enough information here, so to speak, to specify the map. And in general, you need more. You need some extras to make it work, especially if you want to make the control robust, uh, that is, if you wanted to, to work in the absence of, uh, or in the presence of imperfections. You left the phase in for 10 microseconds, which seems like an arbitrary number. How, how long do you actually have to sit in each one of those phase steps? It's a minimum set. So that, that's a, a good question that I don't have uh, 
uh, a real good answer to, other than that we were pretty pragmatic about this. We did a fairly careful study where we changed both the overall time and the time per phase step. And what you see is if the overall time is, gets too short, it stops working. And if the phase steps get too long so that there are too few parameters here, it also stops working. So there's some combination that we can find via tri trial and error that works best. And then your 99.5% probability, you said is like half the time out of 100, um, it ends up in the wrong state, as opposed to in, a, in almost the right 95% of the correct state, are they, are they different? I mean, do you end up in a completely wrong state 0.5% of the time? Uh, so I'm not, we, have, we have to be a little bit careful about what that question means in the context of quantum mechanics. Uh, what I'm telling you really is only that 99.5% we end up in the right state. If you, if you measure which of the states in an orthogonal basis, one of, which, one of these states being the target state, if you measure is it in the target state, is it in any of these other ones, what you find is that 99.5% it's in the target state. And in the other 0.5%, uh, it is somewhere else in state space. Not necessarily a particular state, but somewhere that's orthogonal to the target state. Right, so it could be any coherent superposition of the remaining 15. That we do not measure with this technique. Right. It's quite interesting if it goes wrong, uh, if you can look at how it goes wrong, you might, that might give you some information about how to correct. Okay, back to uh, quantum simulation. The idea of modeling one system to the, uh, with another. This is an idea that's often credited to uh, Richard Feynman, as so many other things. Uh, this is uh, from a keynote speech that he gave uh, at a conference back in the early 80s. And uh, uh, what he was saying was sort of in his uh, inimitable style. So what I want to talk about is what somebody suggested nobody would talk about. I want to talk about the problem of simulating the f physics with computers, and I mean that in a specific way, which I'm going to explain. And he goes on for a while, and then he says, the first question is, what kind of computer are we going to use to simulate physics? Which is a good question. And then he goes on for pages and pages and pages. It's a very long paper. And if you read through it, uh, or if you read somebody else's summary of this paper, uh, what you end up with are some uh, sort of carry away messages. The first one is that simulating quantum physics with a classical computer is really, really hard, especially if you're dealing with a quantum many-body system. And the reason why those are particularly hard to deal with is that you have this possibility of having entanglement that is quantum correlations between uh, uh, quantum particles. And that means that you need much, much more information that is many more probability amplitudes that you have to keep track of in order to uh, uh, model a many-body system. On the other hand, a quantum system can simulate its own physics quite nicely. Right? A computer, after all, is nothing but a physical system. And presumably, that physical system doesn't have to be classical like this. It could be a quantum mechanical system. And, you know, it, it would simulate its own behavior fine. So maybe we can simulate one quantum system with another quantum system that's easier to control and observe. That's often a situation we have, actually. We might want to understand the physical behavior of something like uh, a high TC superconductor, for example, one of these cuprate things that are superconducting at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Nobody understands how that can happen, right? And, and one of the problems is it's very hard to look inside a material like that and understand what's going on. But uh, maybe we can find some other quantum system that has some of the same physical ingredients and see if that also uh, produces that phenomenon. That would be the basic idea, maybe we should say the dream of quantum simulation. This is a field that's uh, probably at least a decade old, but I would say it really gained steam maybe five years ago. This is from, this is, uh, from a, an issue, issue of nature physics that focused on quantum simulation and described how it was now being pursued on different physical platforms. So uh, here's one example that I like. Uh, this is the, the this is uh, 
the idea that rather than dealing with electrons in the periodic potentials that you find in a solid, you can take ultra-cold atoms, say a BEC or a Fermi condensate, and you can put them in what's called an optical lattice, so that those are periodic potentials that are created by light. And these atoms, uh, you can actually, so this is, this is a drawing, this is from Marcus Greiner's lab at Harvard, uh, they have some way of trapping and cooling and illuminating atoms that are trapped in a plane and then looking at them with a the super powerful microscope. So they can actually see atoms here, they're, they're trapped, uh, they can be trapped in little potential walls that are about a micron apart. And what they're doing here is that they're varying the depth of the trapping lattice and they're seeing the system self-assemble in a particular way. This is known as a Mott insulator transition. Uh, so that's just one particular platform people are looking at in, in the hope of learning uh, how a certain physical behavior might be described by certain model, model Hamiltonians, for example. But people are looking at this also using other platforms like trapped ions, photons, superconductors, etc. Right, so this is to give you an idea of uh, what uh, a quantum simulator might actually look like. Now, all this is, again, is largely a question of really, really accurate quantum control. And that's probably going to be really, really hard. How hard? Well, people have, have, talked about, have thought about this actually going all the way back to the early days of quantum computing. Uh, here is uh, the start of a paper by Rolf Landauer, uh, where he asks, well, a quantum computer, a quantum mechanical computer, uh, is in some sense a return to the idea of analog computation, or so he thought. He says, an analog computer can do much more per step than a digital computer, but an analog computer in which a physical variable such as a voltage can take on any value within a permitted range does not allow for easy error correction. Therefore, in the analog computer, errors due to unintentional imperfections in the machinery build up quickly and the procedure can go through only a few successive steps before the errors accumulate prohibitively. Then he says in quantum parallelism, which was the uh, picture people had of how quantum computers would work at the time, we do not just use zero and one, but all their possible coherent superpositions. This continuum range, which gives quantum parallelism its power, also gives it the problems of analog computation, uh, a point first explicitly stated by, and so on and so forth. Uh, this turned out to be an imperfect understanding of how a quantum computer could be error corrected by digitizing the errors themselves. Not something that, that we need to go into right now, but just to say that this is something people worried about very early on uh, in when they were first talking about doing quantum information processing. And so now, quantum simulators, like the one I just showed you with the optical lattice, are definitely analog, and there's no error correction in there. Okay, so if something goes wrong, there's nothing that can sort of detect the errors and correct them. Uh, so, now this question again arises, what about errors? So this is a, a, a commentary by Ignacio Sirac and Peter Zoller, who were are important players in this field, uh, talking about, uh, this fr from that the nature physics issue, talking about this challenge, how is this prone to errors? Classical chaotic systems are hard to simulate, even classically, owing to exponential sensitivity. We can ask an analogous, system, uh, an, an analogous question for certain non-integrable many-body quantum systems. Okay. In other words, these guys are not really sure if we could trust a quantum simulation to give us a meaningful answer. Certainly, we know that the microscopic uh, details, such as the particular quantum state of the simulator, is going to be very sensitive to imperfections. But the hope is that there are global features, such as phase transitions, that might be more resilient. Maybe they can be reproduced even by an imper imperfect analog quantum simulator, but nobody really knows. So, you thought in my group, let's try to simulate something really hard and see how well we can do and try to start getting a handle on uh, the role of errors and imperfections. So that takes me to the last topic. I think I'm in, in reasonably good shape for time. Takes me to the last topic, namely quantum chaos and how to simulate it and how that pushes the limits of quantum control. First, what is chaos? Uh, there is a specific uh, definition in classical physics 
in terms of hypersensitivity to initial condition, you start here or you start epsilon away, and that small difference in starting conditions have big consequences downstream. Uh, another way of putting it is the butterfly effect, hypersensitivity to perturbation. Right? You're familiar with the butterfly effect, right? Uh, you have uh, a weather system developing, and then there's a darn butterfly down in Honduras that flaps its wings, and that disturbs the weather system infinitesimally, and uh, rather than the forecast going on the trajectory you thought it should, it goes off in some other direction. And if this uh, deviation is exponentially sensitive to the perturbation, then you have cares. That is, if this final distance here grows exponentially with the size of the perturbation, the degree to which the butterfly flapped its wings, then you have cares. Right? That idea has been around for, for quite some time uh, in classical physics, and it turns out the hypersensitivity to perturbation carries over nicely into quantum physics. So, Again, we want a test bed. And uh, there's one particular model system for chaos that's very popular. It's a so-called kick top. So let me describe to you what a kick top is. It's a driven spin system. Well, sounds familiar, right? Uh, so what is a spin? A spin is a vector that has magnitude and direction. We can specify it by its three uh, components along the x, y, z axis, jx, jy, and jc. But if the spin is always of the same length, uh, we are not spinning the top faster or slower, well, then it can be described by a point on the surface of a sphere with the appropriate radius. OK. So the kick top uh, drives the spin in a very particular way. It's sort of a two-step dance. First, you rotate the spin around the axis y, for example, uh, by some fixed angle that we call alpha. And then we rotate it around x. But now it's kind of a nonlinear rotation. We rotate uh, by an angle that's proportional to the x component. Sometimes this is called a twist. OK, so let's see what happens. Here's an initial condition. First, you rotate around the y-axis by some fixed amount. And then you rotate around the x-axis by an amount that's proportional to the uh, uh, x component. And you can see here the x component is negative. So we're going to rotate like that. On the other hand, if we start here, rotation by a fixed angle, right now the uh, x component is positive, so we rotate like that. You can see that an initial small deviation here became a big deviation very quickly. Right, that's kind of how we get chaos in the classical kick top. We do it over and over and over and over and over, right, and you get chaotic motion on the sphere. So how should we think about this? Well, there's this particular idea that you can think of the spin pointing in a particular direction as a, as a dot on the surface of a sphere. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say this point, for example, is the starting point. Then we do step one, step two, kick, twist, kick, twist, uh, in the terminology of the kick top. Right? And the spin is going to gyrate around on a closed orbit, perhaps. That's at least this one possibility. You might start it in another place, and it will go wander around seemingly at random. Right? So what we've done here is we've color coded. That is, whatever is red is associated with stable or orbits in what's called a stable island, or a random meander through what we call the sea of chaos. Right? So in the blue region, the motion has the properties of chaos. In the red region, has a proper property of regular motion. This is for particular combinations of the fixed rotation and this nonlinear strength. Uh, you can make the, the motion completely regular. You can make it completely cha chaotic. Or you can have, a, can have a mixed phase space, as this is called. This is referred to as a phase space. right? And it's mixed because you have both regular islands and chaotic, uh, a, cha a sea of chaos. An interesting thing is that a classical system cannot cross the boundaries between regular and chaotic motion. That's forbidden in classical mechanics. And so these, these boundaries and these islands are kind of global features. And it turns out that they have some analogy to phases and the appearance or morphing. For example, these two islands here, for certain parameters, they are sort of stuck together and then they separate and that's analogous to a phase transition in in some way. 
So this has some of the flavor uh, that we're after. Now, classical versus quantum spins. The classical spin is a point on a sphere. Not surprisingly, in quantum mechanics, we're going to have an uncertainty relation. You can't know all three components of a spin at the same time. So if you know the length, you're going to have some uncertainty about the transverse components. There's an uncertainty patch associated with it, which you can shape in different ways, but there's a minimum area to it. Uh, this, we're going to visualize and also quantitatively model in terms of a qu what's called a quasi-probability distribution. Uh, in most cases, you can just think of it as the probability of finding the spin pointing in, diff in slightly different directions within a cone. It's somewhat analogous to a wave function. So if, if you want to think about it as a quantum wave function, that would be OK. OK, back to our cesium atom. So now it's quantum mechanics, so we have to think about it in terms of a Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian has two parts. Uh, the part that's proportional to the to JY, the Y component of the quantum mechanical spin. Uh, we implement that with pulses of magnetic field. So every so often we kick the system with a short magnetic field pulse. And then there's this nonlinear term here, which we can implement uh, with the light shift from a laser. Again, this is just messy atomic physics we don't need to go into. And we can apply this to, for example, this spin down here. So we did an experiment like that uh, nearly a decade ago. So what you're seeing here again is the classical phase space with its regular islands and the sea of chaos. And then what you see here is an experimentally measured quasi-probability distribution that is associated with a, a spin 3, an atom in this state here, that was uh, prepared so it, it had maximum projection. It pointed in this particular direction that happened to overlap with this island here. It's, of course, a big fat uncertainty distribution because this is a very deeply quantum mechanical spin. So what happens if we let that go under the kick-top dynamics? Right? So this is our starting point. Uh, we can go in and reconstruct, experimentally do this quantum state tomography and find out what the state is and therefore what this quasi-probability distribution is at any point. So we, here we've done it after four cycles, four cycles of step one, step two, kick, twist, kick, twist. Right? And you can see that it's changing. And uh, it gradually, actually, it changes a lot. It actually moves over to this island here, which is classically forbidden. But it can occur due to the phenomenon of quantum tunneling. This is known as, as uh, dynamical tunneling. Anyway, it, uh, it's actually very close to a two-level system. It, it Rabi oscillates back to the other island reasonably well, and then the Rabi oscillation decoheres gradually due to imperfections in the experiment. So that's one thing we can do. Here's another movie where I have to show both spheres, a half, both, both halves of the spheres, I should say both hemispheres, where we started the system, the spin down here, right? you can see that sits down here, and then we let it go. And now you can see that it's a lot more complicated what's happening. This probability distribution gets wildly contorted over time. Not only is it hard to make sense of this one movie, but if I change the parameters in the Hamiltonian, the angle and the twist strength, ever so slightly, which I can do just by waiting two days and starting the experiment up again, I'm not going to get to exactly the same values, then probably by the time I got to frame 40, this image would look quite different. Right, so this is actually something that can be a challenge to reproduce. It was, certainly was in the uh, experiment we did 10 years ago. There is, however, a way to look at this. You can take all these frames and average them together. That would tell us where the system went and where it didn't go. And similarly with this movie here. And if we do that, we see this. Okay. So experimental data, theory. This is where we start on this island, right? And you can see it goes back and forth between them. Red is high probability, blue is none. Uh, if we start in the sea of chaos down here, right, it stays in the sea of chaos. Red is where it goes, blue is where it, is where it doesn't. So it avoids this island and these two. And finally, if we start in the big island, it just stays there, right? So that's neat. A couple of takeaway observations and hypothesis, right? The quantum kick top, even if it's very deeply quantum, reflects the phase space structure of the classical system. That's cute. 
And then the hypothesis is that the, these regular chaotic boundaries are kind of global property that is robust, even in the presence of errors at the microscopic level of the quantum state. And I said we couldn't reliably reproduce the quantum state of something that was hopping around in the chaotic sea. But even so, oops, at least it, it, you know, it doesn't cross over these boundaries. So it looks like there's some, something about this global property, more global property, that's robust. So that's nice. Now, I would say what, we, what I just told you about was an implementation of a quantum kicktop. We made one. It was a physical spin that was acted upon by a Hamiltonian. That was the kicktop Hamiltonian. Let's try to do something that's harder. Let's do a simulation of a quantum kicktop. That is, I don't want to use a physical spin. I don't want to use that kind of Hamiltonian. But I want this to simulate that. So how do we do that? Well, here is our 2009 experiment. We made this Hamiltonian here for our atomic spin. And we can think about the kicktop as applying a particular unitary operation that corresponds to step one, step two. So unitary map uh, over and over and over again. This unitary map is called a Floquet operator because we have a, th that's a name for a time step in a periodic uh, sequence. Right? And this acted on this physical spin. But what I told you about at the beginning of this colloquium was uh, that we have a particular Hamiltonian that we can control by modulating phases of RF and microwave fields that can implement any arbitrary unitary map, including this one. And now I'm going to let this act not on this guy here, but this entire 16-dimensional system, which in some sense I can think of as a synthetic spin with 16 states. That is something that has spin 15 halves. Like it would give me 16 levels m sub, m sub j. Right. So I just have to identify each of these 16 states with a particular state of a synthetic spin 15 halves, and then I have to make sure that this matrix looks the same in bo for both the synthetic spin and for this system here. That's the idea, but of course this Hamiltonian doesn't have any of the symmetries and other saving graces of this guy here. So if this fails due to some imperfection, it doesn't fail in any way that knows about, knows about the kick top in any way. And so it, it's, it's an interesting thing. Will these islands of stability and the sea of chaos and the separation between them, will that still survive robustly in a quantum simulator of this kind? I think it's fair to say that we did not know. But this is an experiment that we can do and we have done. And so I'll show you some data. Uh, what I'm showing here in this plot here is the fidelity between the expected and the actual state, by which I mean we feed some input state into our analog quantum simulator, our cesium atom, right? and we apply n of these unitary operators, these Floquet operators, and then we compare it to what we should have gotten if things were perfect. Okay, so again, it's the probability of being in the right state after n kicks. Right? And we can start as a couple of initial states that sat in the regular island and the fidelity evolves like this. And then there are a couple that we put in the sea of chaos. And you can see that the fidelity drops off much faster. It's kind of what we expected because we know that chaos in quantum mechanics manifests itself as hypersensitivity to perturbations or to errors. Right? So chaos is hard. But at the same time, this is still working pretty well. Turns out by using some particular trip, uh, tricks associated with the optimal map of the system onto the simulator, uh, that the fidelity per kick or per cycle of this thing, right, for each, every time we increase n by 1, uh, the fidelity, well, the fidelity per step is between 99.9% .9 for this case and 99.5% for this case. So that's pretty, pretty good, actually. And it's enough that it makes sense to continue for many, many more simulation periods. We've done up to nearly 300. And uh, again, so what we did here was that we changed the parameters of the kicktop a little bit to get ourselves a bigger sea of chaos. But we see the same thing, right? These two points in the regular island, the fidelity is high and it stays high. In the sea of chaos, it drops off. And then there's some rephasing because, after all, there's 
uh, a limited distance the two states can get apart on a sphere, sphere of finite size. And then there's this guy here, which sits on the boundary, then you can see that's an intermediate case. So that's exactly what we would expect. What about the global features? I'll just quickly go over that. Uh, and that will be the last thing to talk about. Right. So that was this idea that, for example, if you look at where the system goes on average, that should reflect the islands and the sea of chaos and the boundaries between them. Doing state tomography and making those movies that we used to make this is a little too hard now that we've made the spin larger, the synthetic spin larger. So we, we're using a different technique. What we do is we look at <coughs> the dynamical eigenstates, so-called floquet states. These are the ones that reproduce themselves to within a phase every step. And it turns out that those, step, those states, we can solve for the eigenstates of this unitary matrix. There are 16 of them, and they're orthogonal. They also can be associated with quasi-probability distributions. And we can quantify how much these various quasi-probability distributions overlap with the islands or with the sea of chaos. And so some of them are regular. You can look at this one. Well, this one here, for example, clearly overlaps with this guy. This one here does as well. Uh, look at this one here. It overlaps with these two islands and so on. We can average them all together. And you can see that this average matches up nicely with this island and these two. And then the chaotic ones, oops, there are more of them. Uh, but again, you can sort of look at them and you can see, uh, uh, for example, uh, let's, let's, pick, let's pick this one here, right? That's sort of nicely contained in this big spot in here. You can average them all together, and you can see uh, that on average they overlap nicely with the blue parts and avoid the islands. And the point of all this is that if we look at a particular initial state, for example, if we started in the center of this big island, right, it's not going to overlap with any of these chaos states at all. Uh, and similarly, if we start uh, somewhere uh, down here in the in the sea, right? That's not going to overlap with any of these regular states at all. So uh, the idea is that we just keep track of. So any state, any initial state, can be described as a cohesive position of the Floquet states. And all we have to make sure of is whether probability amplitude is exchanged between the regular states and the chaotic states. And that turns out to be easy to measure. This is a simulation where we started right in the middle of the big island. Uh, so we had uh, a lot of probability amplitude for one of the Floquet states that is concentrated in the middle of the big island, and hardly any for all the chaotic Floquet states. OK, so this is a num numerical simulation where we applied a static perturbation. That is, we took, I think it was the amplitude of one of the RF, state, RF fields for control and made it put, put it off a little bit, right? And, and what you can see is that there's some, there's some stuff going on. You know, the, 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 these probability amplitude. There are exchanges between uh, the, the regular states, but there's not really anything that leaks into the C over time. So this looks like a nice conservative property. We've done some uh, preliminary testing of this in experiments, not for nearly enough kicks, but it looks fine, actually, with, with the static error. seems to behave the right way. If we start in a chaotic state, that is most of the most of the populated states are, are chaotic. That's these blue bands here shows you the, this is the cumulative plot, right, of how much probability we have for the different, say, 16 different states, some of which are blue and chaotic, some of which are red. So here we start in the sea of chaos and stay there. Here we start in the island and stay there. Time-dependent perturbations are different. This, again, is a numerical simulation. And you can see that with time, uh, with a white noise perturbation, probability will leak from the initial location in the island into the sea of chaos. So this is apparently not a great thing to have. And you can average over many different noise histories to see what happens on, uh, on average. And indeed, uh, it looks like the spectrum of the perturbation has a big effect. So we haven't looked at that yet, but that's one of the things to look at. So just going forward, you can say, well, we have good control at the microscopic level of this quantum simulator for hundreds of kicks. And we've at least seen some signs of resilience of these global features, which is what we hope to see but fear that we may not see. So that's one thing. Then we can say, well, what can we actually learn about analog quantum simulation? Well, 
we can certainly explore the impact of errors in different aspects. And we can ask ourselves, are there strategies, like I've mentioned, robust control that we might use to mitigate errors if they're present? And then finally, what can we learn about quantum chaos? Quantum chaos has seen a, a revival, actually, uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, people are interested in something known as information scrambling. If you put information, in, encode information in a quantum system, how quickly does it sort of spread throughout all the different parts of that quantum system and become inaccessible to observation? It's related to something that's called out-of-time order correlation functions, or OTOX for short, which you can measure. Uh, and what makes this really sexy is that there's a connection to uh, quantum gravity and black holes. It turns out black holes are thought to be the fastest possible information scramblers that are in existence and uh, quantum information is you know it's basically lost at the at the surface our information is lost at the surface of the black hole as, as, uh, as it is sucked in and, and this is something that people are interested in trying to to understand uh, yeah so as I said this is this is a sexy thing I think for us the kind of thing we can look at in our chaotic system in the, is this idea of information scrambling. And I think I would leave it there. So questions?